also for our soloist first lady, Kathy Wilson. Now, I think I graduated from Gentry in 1968. And I had one of those classes that thought they ought to celebrate every year. So you can see that I have celebrated quite a number of times. But the thing is, when we celebrated those uh, special days in our lives, uh -huh. uh, after the celebration, we would do as the class of 81 is doing this morning. Yeah. We would go by the house of God, yeah. some specified place where all of us would go, and we would share the worship with that church congregation. And it so happens that when we would do that, uh, the church would be so gracious that it would allow one of the church, one of the class members to bring the message. Oh, that day. And so I would like to do for you what has been done for me and for the class of 68 so many times. I would like to allow a member of the class, yes. Pastor Matthew Davis, yes. all the way from Houston, Texas, to bring our message for this morning. Yes. So after amazing grace, yes. give a round of applause right now Amen. as we receive <laughs> Pastor Davis. another honor, another opportunity just come before you. God, we thank you, Father God, that you are the great God. You're the one who keeps us, blessing us, and you're the one who keeps us focused. Now, Lord, we come before you because you are holy and we are unholy. Father God, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that we will see Jesus that we will be better, Father God, at 1 o'clock than we were at 10 o'clock. Yeah. That life will roll on just a little while longer. Yeah. That we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about the Jesus we serve. Yeah. Now, Lord, rescue me from me. Yeah. Hide me behind Jesus. Yeah. That he will speak through me. Yeah. That men, women, boys, and girls will have the old habits thrown away. Yeah. Old burdens will be rolled away. Yeah. That we will continue to look to you. Yeah. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. Yeah. All the honor and all the praise. Yeah. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. Yeah. In the strong, mighty, anointed, powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen.
giving honor to God our Father, to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to the Holy Spirit, our leader, our teacher, our comforter, and our guide. It's just good to be here. It's good to be on Mississippi soil where hospitality runs freely. Amen. Let me thank Pastor Wilson and the First United Baptist Church of Inyo, Mississippi for allowing us to come this way one more time. It's not often I get a chance to preach for a preacher who is much older than I am. <laughs> but look just as good or better than I do. <laughs> who looks like he's in good shape. Yes. But I know better that he, he's not a young man because he taught me in the seventh grade 48 years ago. And just doing the math alone, he, he looks better than he really is. <laughs> well, we thank God for him and, and for his wife and for those of you who are gathered here today. Yes, to the class of 81, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this class and allowing me to, to um, spearhead this on today. There's a young lady that uh, we have been calling Queen from 1980 to 1981. Uh, the year of 1980 and 1981, I'm asking her to stand. I'm asking the entire class to stand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to um, President Thomas and to all of you who are gathered, let me call your attention to Mark chapter 5. I read a few verses here, and he said, I was the preacher for the day, so I got all day to preach. Amen. <laughs> and that's what the pastor said. First six verses, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. In the New Testament, the book is Mark, the chapter 5, Amen. verses are 1 through 6. <clears throat> I'm reading from the New American Standard just because that's what I had in the car. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Nothing mystical about it. Mark chapter 5, when you found it, you will discover these words. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Galileans. When he got off the boat, off out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwellings among the tombs. And no one has been able to bind him anymore, yeah. even with chains. Yeah. Yeah. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Yeah. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming, among the tombs and into the mountains and gasping, gasping himself with stones. Yes. Seeing Jesus, yes. seeing yes. Jesus, yes. seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. King James said he bowed down and worshiped him. Yes. I want to talk about good news from the graveyard. Yes. Good news from the graveyard. Around here, when when I grew up and you got into a confrontation with somebody, you would tell them, you better pray that the Lord bless you because Smith and Dylan will dress you. We would oftentimes say to them that Smith and Dylan will dress you because the Lord has to bless you if you're going to make it. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. When we talk about the graveyard, we often hear names like Byers. And, uh -huh. and we hear names like Smith. We hear names like Dylan. We hear names that we are familiar with as undertakers. Uh -huh. And whenever you call on the undertaker, uh -huh. it's never, ever good news. Yes. We need some good news. Our nation needs good news. Our households need good news. Our Congress, sure enough, needs 
some good news. I came by today to tell you that there's some good news even in the worst place than you can even imagine. Right. Even in the graveyard. Right. We need good news. We need to be optimistic and not so pessimistic that even though the things that are around us, the God that we serve, still has some good news. Yeah. Today, the gospel writer Mark says there's good news even from the graveyard. Yes. I want to lift three thoughts today, and my first thought that I want to mention to you is I see graveyard mentality. Yeah. In, in the text, I see graveyard mentality because the text says this man had his dwelling in the tombs. He was in the tombs and in the mountains day and night. The first thing I see under this graveyard mentality was an unclean spirit. The Bible says he had an unclean spirit. He was demon possessed. He, he was not controlled by himself. He had an unclean spirit. When you run into folk that will shoot you for no apparent reason, it's because they have an unclean spirit. When children bad mouth and talk back to grown folk, I didn't have that privilege when I was growing up. We couldn't say, ooh, we couldn't say no. We had to say yes, ma'am, no, sir, and we had to say it without hesitation. It's when children disrespect old people, it may just be that they have an unclean spirit. The text declares that this man in Mark chapter 5 not only had unclean spirit, he had an unpleasant living. He was living in the tombs. The Bible says he was dwelling in the tomb. It would have been all right if there was a snake in the graveyard. It would have been all right if there was a dog in the graveyard. But God's pleasure, God's design, God's treasure was found in the graveyard. Amen. Psalm 8 says, what is, what is man that God is so mindful of him that he created him a little lower than the angel? And here is God's valued possession living in the graveyard. He had an unpleasant living and he had uncomfortable conditions. In the graveyard, in the graveyard, you ought not be comfortable there. Some people go out there and they sit and they talk to their loved ones. I hadn't talked to daddy since he'd been down there. Some people, some people spend spend their time doing Mother's Days and holidays, and, and it's all right if it makes you feel good. But I talked to him enough while he was living. I don't need to talk to him since he's been there. Matter of fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing called necromancy, meaning that we transcend with the dead. We, we communicate with the dead. You have no business living in the grave. That's an uncomfortable position for me. That's uncomfortable. Next thing I see with this graveyard mentality is the fact that this man had unnecessary violence in the graveyard. The Bible says that no man could shackle him, no man could chain him, but when they shackled him and they chained him, he broke the chain. Let me tell you, it wasn't necessary that they shackled him, it wasn't necessary that they chained him, they just needed to introduce him to Jesus. Young people today need to know Jesus. Some of them don't have mental conditions. They just need to know Jesus. Some of them are not troubled in their mind and, and they are not hearing other voices. They need to hear the voice of Jesus. Let me tell you, if you get a young person hooked on Jesus, you will get him saved and you will get him under control. Next thing, next thing I see, you can tell when folk got graveyard mentality. You, you can tell when people have graveyard mentality, they are going nowhere. They are dead. They, when, when boys walk around with their britches around their knees, uh, it's called graveyard mentality. I mean, even if the police get after you, you can't run. All right. It is it's graveyard mentality. Next thing I see on the graveyard mentality is uncontrollable strength. Uh -huh. This man was so out of control until he broke chain. He yeah. broke handcuffs. He broke shackles. I see why police officers are running 
and, and denying the call is simply because we got a new brother on the scene now that's so strong and, and they are so doped up until nobody can handle them. But they need to know Jesus. When they get to know Jesus, they will be under control. The next thing I see about this man with his uh, his uh, graveyard mentality is he's not he doesn't have a tameable mindset. He has an untamable mindset. His mindset is off the charts. His, his mind, he doesn't think like normal people think. And I've run into some folk, not here, but at the church around the corner down the street. I, I've run into some folk before that, that they, their mind is just way out there. They, they got some stuff going on that I never even thought about. They, they got some things in their mind that you can't even get them under control. It's because they have an untamable mindset. When you tell folk, you if you keep spending money and keep taking it out of the pot and you don't put anything in the pot, then the pot is going to go empty. Let me tell you, they think they can spend it all in one day. They think they can spend it all in one place. Baby, if you keep asking somebody else for money every month to pay your rent, let me just share with you. Sooner or later, you need to create your budget and sit down because you need to be tamed. I just, I want to serve notice on you this morning. I want to serve notice on you so I can save your money. Let me help you save your money from your kinfolk. Let me, let me help you save your money from your friends. Number one... Number one, the reason why small businesses go out of business is because every friend and every family member wants you to give them something for free. The next thing I need to let you know, that folk, folk will always buy what they want and beg for what they need. They will always buy stuff they want, and then they'll come and tell you, oh, my car note is due. Oh, I've got to buy some medication, and they know you're not going to turn them down. The second time they come to you, you sit down with paper and pen and say, baby, let's look at what you can do and what you can't do. Yeah. Next thing I see, I see unfavorable, unfavorable, unfavorable noises. King James declares that this man is crying out loud in the graveyard. Yes. The Bible says that he's making noise as he, he's crying in the graveyard. A full grown man crying out in the graveyard. Let me just stop right here and tell the men in the room, it's all right to cry when you got something to cry about. See, when I grew up, my mama was about 98 pounds and, and we were towering over her. And then she would, she would whip you and say, shut up that crime before I give you something to cry about. And I'm standing there, I'm wondering, what was the last 20 minutes all about? <laughs> Shut up before I give you something to cry about. I mean, out of lashes, after the last 20 minutes, she's been wailing on me. And every now and then, I know y'all are not allowed to whip children these days, but I turned out all right if you ask me. It, 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 every now and then, when she got the whipping on me, she got the end of the belt confused. You'll get that when you get to the house. You understand that thing. So finally, because he was stuck in graveyard mentality, he had some unwelcome visitors. These were demons. Demons will make you act a fool. Demons will make you live where you don't deserve to live. Demons will make you look down on yourself. Demons will give you low self-esteem. And demons will tell you you are not about anything. That's why we can't tell our children that you will never be anything. You need to boost your children and pop their self-esteem. You need to remind your children that the Bible says in Psalm 139 and verse 14, you are beautifully and wonderfully made, great of the heavenly works of God, and that I know right now. You need to boost their self-esteem. And every time they get on the wrong, wrong track, tell them they're better than that. God has made you better than that. This is not for you. This man was real pessimistic. He got so disturbed in the graveyard, he started cutting himself. Cutting himself with stones. Lashing and gashing himself with stones. Demons will make you hurt yourself. 
Demons will make you hurt yourself. And I hope I'm telling somebody, hold your hope right now. Don't give up. Don't give out. And don't give in. God is here. He's available. And he can make things work for you. Don't commit suicide. Don't hurt yourself. Don't do yourself any harm. God is the one who made you. And God alone deserves and reserves the right to take your life. Graveyard mentality. Do you have graveyard mentality? I'm, I'm not talking about how long you've been saved. I'm, I'm not talking about how long you've been on this road. I, I'm not talking about how long you've been singing and how long you've been preaching and how long you've been deaconing. I'm talking about every now and then. If you don't have demon possession, every now and then you can have demon influences. And it kind of goes like this, girl. You know I don't mean to talk about anybody. <laughs> Graveyard yeah, you know, I, 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 I really don't want to tell this. And, and when I tell you, don't tell anybody else. You need to stop that graveyard mentality right there and say, now, if, you, if I can't tell it, then don't you tell me. And if they push it on you, if they make sure you hear it anyway, catch them by the hand and pull them by the arm. Say, let's go to the person and let's confront the person and let's make sure the person knows that things are not going right. Pull them. And that's the only way we're going to get rid of it. Graveyard mentality. The second thing, the second thing I see in this passage, Verses 1 through 20 in this pericope, and the second thing I see in this pericope is the fact that God's deliverance is present. If you have graveyard mentality, don't give up. God's deliverance is available. Look at verse number 6. Now, here this man is. He's cutting himself, he's living in the graveyard. He's breaking handcuffs, he's breaking shackles, he's breaking chains, and people are afraid of him, and they are looking for a way to, to shackle him and to keep him quiet and to tame him. King James says that no man can tame him, no, not one. But verse number six says, when he saw Jesus. Verse number six declares that, that when he saw Jesus. The Bible says he ran to Jesus. He bowed down to Jesus. And he worshiped Jesus. Some of you in this room know my background. Some of you in this room know that I didn't grow up uh, doing all that I do now. And some of you knew that I had graveyard mentality. But let me just share with you. I met Jesus. And since I met Jesus, my life has since I met Jesus, things are made the better. I don't act like I used to act. I don't go where I used to go. I don't spend my time where I used to spend my time. It's because I met Jesus. It's not because I'm so saved. It's not because I'm so sanctimonious. It's not because I got it going on. It's my money can't get me there, but Jesus can. Let me just share with you, let me just share with you, you may have some money, but it's going to run out. I guarantee the doctor going to make sure it runs out. When you look at this, this text, the text says there's a number one, another woman further down, and this woman that's further down past verse number 20, she says that she spent all she had with so many doctors. And she was made no better. She was made the worst. And because she was made the worst, she had an issue of blood that was screaming for 12 long years. But when she touched the hem of his God, she was made whole. The Bible declared she didn't even have to touch Jesus. She touched the hem of his God. I want to serve you notice this morning, it was no medicine in the H-E-M him. The medicine was in the H-I-M him. It was in Jesus himself. We need to drag our children to Jesus. We need to tell our kids folks about Jesus. We need to get them to Jesus. And God's deliverance would be possible. Jesus knows your weaknesses. Jesus knows your troubles. Jesus knows your trials, and Jesus knows all that you're going through. You need to tell it to Jesus. When one submits to Jesus, his or her life is remade. 
Right. When one submits to Jesus, his or her life is renewed. Yes. When one submits to Jesus, his or her life is restored. Yes. Oh, Jesus has the power to evict the demons. Jesus has the power to heal us from our sickness. Let me tell you, keep on going to the doctor. Keep on taking your medication because God wants to minister to the doctor through you. The doctor wants to see and Jesus wants the doctor to see how Jesus is making you whole again. So don't stop the medication. Don't stop going to the doctor. You just make sure you testify when you go to the doctor. I looked at good morning America. I looked at good morning America and the 11 year old just a few steps from here said it wasn't the doctor that healed me. The 11 year old, 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 year old said it wasn't the doctors that saved me. It was God that saved me. Somebody needs to get on that bandwagon this morning. Somebody needs to get to the point where they understand that doctors can treat, but only Jesus can heal. Jesus has the power to evict the devil. Your issues are safe with Jesus. Your issues are safe with Jesus. Jesus can fix it, and Jesus will fix it. The Bible says even the demons start hollering when Jesus showed up. Go ahead and read the text when you get home. It said, the demons said, what will we have to do with you, Jesus? Son of the most high God. The problem is the demons recognize Jesus, but church folk don't recognize Jesus. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem here. The demons recognize Jesus. And those of us who fought the pews, those of us who got past COVID, those of us that God has left on paradise one more time, we don't know how to praise him. And Jesus, son of the most high God. And Jesus evicted them. Some women need to evict the rascal. Some men need to evict her. Now marriage counseling is still in order. But those of you who have not, who have not passed that way, we need to understand that you are special to God. And you don't let anybody mistreat you in the name of love. Y'all used to sing that song, yeah. In the Name of Love. Yeah. BB said, The thrill is gone. When the thrill is gone, you ought to get gone. Yeah. If he or she does not walk in Jesus, yeah. it's time for you to move over, move around, move on down. It's simply because the woman who is born of, of God will always lead the man who is unborn. But don't go get you a rascal you got to work on. Y'all didn't hear that, did you? Don't go and drag somebody out and run on a rock just so you can work on them. You're not a mechanic that you can fix everything. Let Jesus fix it. And when Jesus fixes it, he is fixed. My final point, and I'll leave you alone. My final point, I, I don't leave you alone. Go get, get me some red soda, water, watermelon, and barbecue. My final point is gratitude is leading to evangelism. When we look at the text, the Bible says that Jesus evicted the demons, yes. sent them into the swine. All right. The swine ran down into the river, and they drowned themselves. Let me tell you, the demons need a host. The demons need somebody they can live in. That's why the songwriter said, don't let the devil ride, because if you let him ride, he will begin to, oh yeah, the devil will begin to drive. So the devil needs a host. The devil needs somebody he can live in. He needs somebody he can hitchhike on. Now, girl, don't let him hitchhike on you. Get rid of that stuff. Get, get it off of you. Make sure that you stay in Jesus and remind your friends, gossip is not on my agenda for the day. Text verses 14 through 20. Gratitude is leading to evangelism. Yes. Two things that is very neglected in the church today. Number one is prayer. Yes. Pastor Wilson, you call prayer, I mean you miss some of us. I dare say most of us. The second thing that's missing in the church is evangelism. 
But when we look at the text and we examine the text, the first thing I noticed is that the hog feeders yes, told the story uh -huh. about Jesus. Right. Yeah, yeah, the hog feeders that, that had lost their enterprise, the hog feeders that had lost their entrepreneurship, the hog feeders that had lost their hog, they ran and told the story about Jesus. Yeah. The second thing I see, the gratitude is the people went to see what Jesus had done. Right. The town folk, you know, folk like to see. You see an ambulance go down the road, folk come out the house that, that ain't been out the house all week long. <laughs> If you hear a siren from a police car, folks that had not come out all day long, oh, it's too hot out there. Now they're standing on pavement, burning their feet because they're bare feet with their robes on. Let me tell you, when people hear some noise, they will come running. So the people went to see what Jesus had done. Secondly, the people, when they got there, they saw the miracle that had taken place. The Bible says they saw this man that was demon-possessed. He was clothed and in his right mind. What, what the text is saying to us, to live in the graveyard, you're not in your right mind. To hang out with the dead, you're not in your right mind. But what you need to know, when people see you, they need to see you differently from what they saw you before. Oh, every now and then when I come in and old Mississippi, folk will tell me, oh, you different, you changed. And I just have to tell them, I met Jesus. I met him, Jesus the Christ, and that's why I'm saved. Now, I, I, I hang out with them. I spend time with them. I socialize with them. I don't down talk them. That's why we can't flood our churches because you've been saved two months and now you got a Holy Ghost and you don't want anybody in life. I want all the prostitutes and all the dope dealers. Go get them and bring them on in. All the lesbians and all the homosexuals. Go get them and bring them on in. Get all the clubbers and, and bring them on in. And they looked at me like I was crazy the first time I said it. I said, because when it comes to evangelism, they are not scared like you were scared. See, you've been in church too long. You've been worshiping so long. Let me tell you, the blessing will come when the church leaves the building. They saw him sitting, they saw him clothed, and they saw him in their right, in his right mind. He was so grateful. His gratitude was so great. He was so grateful. When you look at the text, you find out that this man offered to volunteer to walk with Jesus. Yes. We look at verses 18, 19, and 20. He wanted to go with Jesus. The Bible says when Jesus got back on the boat, he came and asked Jesus, can he go with him? And Jesus gave him the same answer he gave up. No, you can't come to me. You can't go with me in verse 19. He said, no, don't go with me. What I need you to do is go back home and tell the folk that you live with what good things God has done to you. Let me share with you. You need to tell the story of how good God has been. Because Jesus gives us good news from the graveyard. You see, the graveyard, Jesus is familiar with the graveyard. When you look at Lazarus in John chapter 11, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And guess what Lazarus did? He rose from the dead. When you look at Mark chapter 5, Jairus' daughter was dead. Jesus told her to come forth. Jesus is not afraid of the dead, and he's not afraid of the graveyard. But let me just share with you, over 2,000 years ago, on a skull hill called Calvary, Jesus of Christ died on Calvary. They nailed him tight. They lifted him high. They dropped him low. He died on Calvary. And mean men killed him. He was an innocent man. He hung between two thieves. They took him off the cross, laid him in a barber tomb. But out of that third day morning, he rose with all power. He upset the graveyard. But I stopped by to tell you on my way to the rapture, that's not the last time Jesus is going to upset the graveyard. One of these old days, at the top of God, at the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise, and those who remain will be caught up with him in there. Jesus understands the dead, and Jesus understands the graveyard. I'm going over yonder, but it's no more tiring, no more sleeping, no more bitterness, no more backbiting. It's the place of no more, no more crying over there 
it will be good morning every day. I'm going to join you in round the throne of grace. Crying, holy, holy, holy. Blessing is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Will you go with me? I'm on my way to do the land. So the weeping shall cease from God. The weary will be no more. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. He's able. He will do it. And he has to. Right now, we're going to announce an open door. So much teaching in his preaching. Somebody now ought to know who Jesus is. And I know you heard him call me old man. <laughs> Y'all heard it, man. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to tell you something. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. I want to preach just like you. When I grow up, when this old man, when he grows up, somebody here today, you have opportunity to grow up. Grow up in your understanding of the Lord. Grow up in your understanding of what the Lord wants of you. So if you're here and we're announcing an open door, you're invited to come. Musicians are going to play and the choir is going to sing. And you're invited to come.
work. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Now thanks to Pastor Matthew Davis. All the way from Houston, Texas. so thankful this morning that he didn't come empty-handed, empty-headed, or empty-hearted. But he came full in every way. God bless you, my young brother. May the Lord keep you and keep on using you in a mighty way. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to hear a few announcements, and we're going to let you go home. <laughs>